take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to uh, do a longer introduction before I get here, and then it will make sense. Because if I just read this passage, you'd be like, oh, I've heard this before. I don't know if I understand, but I've heard this before. We're talking about the Spirit of God. And I, I, I want to kind of illustrate this. I want this to be in your mind, because sometimes the subject that we're talking about today we, we disconnect our emotions, we disconnect the purpose of it from, from what God has instilled in our hearts for this to be the action of our lives. So the Spirit of God we talked about from the very beginning is the move of God. I talked, brought it all the way back to the beginning when we talked about uh, the, God creating the earth. And there was the Ruach of God or the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God went out. It worked and it created and it gave life. And when he created Adam and Eve there was dirt and there was Adam, but there was no life. And God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That was the Spirit of God. We take it all the way to the New Testament. What do we find? The Spirit of God. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. You know how you're saved today? Because of the Spirit of God. If you want conviction to work in the church, it doesn't happen because we have great music or great programs or graphics or whatever. It happens through the Spirit of God. You want to see the lost brought in, it's the Spirit of God. You want to see the wayward restored. If you want to see addictions broken, there is a power, which is the Ruach, or the Spirit of God, that does what man cannot do. This is the power of God. This is the presence of God with us. This is is the Spirit of God. And you you say, why don't we live right here? You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't it be great if this is, this is where we stayed? Wouldn't it be great if we were just constantly seeing God work and the outpouring of God and the, the fullness of the Spirit of God? We would like, I want to live right here. But we don't. Why? So I was leaving Walmart. It was late at night. And I, was, I ran up to get something. Me and Logan were working on a project. You know, when somebody's like hustling something in the park, have you ever been there and you thought, man, that, that looks kind of shady. I don't know if I should go over there. Or they were like, I think they were selling something, whatever. I got a little nervous, whatever. And I'm just like, for the sake of my reputation stuff, I'm not going to even, you know, dabble with that. So I, was, I walked way around it and then I came back out and they were out there hustling again. I didn't know, I didn't know if it was drugs. I didn't know if they were selling stuff that they stole. But I went over there anyways and I bought a box. I just because... <laughs> Uh, I gave in, and, and, and they, these cute little girls were over there. They were, they were like, would you like to buy a, a thing of our cookies and things? And I'll tell you, this is, this is one of the best cookies in all the world. It's Samoa. Now, uh, there is the Oreo, okay? That is the king, okay? There's nothing better than the Oreo. Does any, anybody out there back me up on that? Did nobody? Okay, the Oreo is just an, a, a solid cookie, all right? But these cookies, let me read it. It's crisp cookies with caramel, coconut, and dark chocolatey stripes all over them. It's like, they're just beautiful. Me and Jenny get in this debate where between uh, cookies and donuts. She says, I'd rather have a hot, fresh donut. I say, I'd rather have cookie crumble. Uh, You can go back and forth on there. It it does sometimes cause division in her house. But she knows how much I love these cookies. So they're only out for a limited time because of when they're selling them and stuff. So I was, uh, I was at home. I'd been on a diet for about a week and a half. I was doing good. And Jenny came home and she said, you'll never guess what I found at Walmart. She said, they sell the Keebler cookies that are like the Girl Scout cookies. Uh, just like that. They're called like coconut dream cookies or something like that. And I told her, I said, babe, I appreciate you buying those for me, but there's not a chance in the world I'm eating them. I said, you can just put them away. Put them in the cabinet or whatever. I'm not touching those things. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not ruining my diet for a stupid cookie. I'm not doing it. So like a week later, I was sitting on the couch. And uh, I was, I was uh, thinking about how good I was that week with my diet and everything. And I thought, I really deserve a reward. So I thought, it would not hurt to have a cookie. I'm not saying a bunch of cookies. I'm saying a cookie. So I went in the cabinet, I grabbed the package, I brought it back to the couch with me. I don't know why I did that if I just wanted a cookie, but I did. And I sat it down and I opened it up and I took out a cookie. And then I was thinking, man, that is such a good cookie. It's almost as good as the uh, Girl Scout cookies. Then I I picked up the package, I'm just reading it. And then I read in the back and it said, uh, uh, a serving size is actually two cookies. I thought, well, (laughs) if a serving size is two cookies, I'm going to have two cookies. So I had two cookies. So I'm sitting there, and sometimes goes by, and I'm, I'm staring at that. I'm staring at the TV. I'm staring 
uh, at, at the cookies again. Then I thought, you know what? It wouldn't hurt, honestly, to have two servings. I mean, two servings of something is not a lot. So I had four cookies. Ten minutes later, I ate the entire pack of cookies. <laughs> Eighteen cookies in that thing. It was 1,300 calories. And I was sitting there. I, I was so embarrassed. And then, you know, I was got up and I was going to uh, go throw the trash. But when you do trash like that, you have to hide it down in there because she... Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. And so I went over there, and Jenny comes on at that exact spot. She goes, I thought you weren't eating those cookies. I was like, no, I'm just putting them away now. And she was like, oh, my goodness, they are all gone. <laughs> Did you eat that whole pack of cookies? Now, oftentimes, when we're dealing with stuff like that, we blame the devil. You know, you know what I'm saying? The devil made me do it. Can, can I introduce? We're talking about the spirit. We're talking about something that's very biblical here. It's actually our flesh. Our, our, our flesh is what works in our minds to pull us towards cookies. Our flesh is what is the battle within our hearts and minds when it comes to losing our temper. Which, when it comes to, I'm going to be do good this week. I'm going to do the right things and say the right things. There is a battle that's between these two things. If we don't acknowledge it, that is how we get into trouble. There's two factors that I want you to understand. Well, there's a lot of things that we're going to discuss Number one, we're all made of flesh. I don't care who you are. If you're here today, you are made of flesh. Everything that I'm talking about today applies to you just as much. You're sitting there thinking, I thought we were talking about revive and revival and God working our hearts. I am. We'll get there. I'll explain this. But we're all made of flesh. Every single one of us. Number two, we all struggle with our flesh. We do. I need to sit there and say, I think I've got this under control, or I'm doing pretty good with it. You are made of flesh, and if you are made of flesh, I promise you, you struggle with your flesh. Our bodies have become our masters. Our flesh has become a challenge for us. You know, and we say, the devil made us do it. And we sit there and say, man, the devil's working on me hard. A lot of times, the devil has nothing to do with it. It's not the devil, it's your flesh. But we don't, we, it's easy to divert and blame everything else around us and blame our spouses and things like that. Our society, I'm going to say some things and I want you guys to know that I'm speaking this from my heart. I believe this is biblical and it's a real issue, but I just want us to be real and transparent with this. Our society, especially in America, is run by pleasures and we're run by food. We are. It's, we don't, we don't run our lives because of the idea that, well, I, I, I need food to survive. No, we, we, we have gotten past that in America. And I'm not saying that we don't need food to survive. The Bible says in Philippians, when he was calling this out in Philippians 3.19, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who do mind earthly things. We have gravitated towards a society of instant gratification. I'm hungry. I'm going to order it. I'm going to go through the drive through I'm going to do it on the app. I'm going to go to a vending machine. I, I, I want, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get a venti. I'm going to get a grande. I'm going to get, I'm going to get it super size. I'm going to go. It is, we, we go out to eat. I sit there and it's like, I, I want an appetizer. I want bread. I want my meal. I want a big extra side. I, and I want dessert afterwards. Besides the fact that I'm going to have a Coke with that, that has 200 calories in of itself. And you sit there and say, I don't have a problem with my flesh. Yeah, we probably don't, does it? I mean, that's, none of this applies to any of us. It's our flesh. Through our flesh, we struggle with so many different things. We struggle with our identity. It's like we want to be liked. We want to be accepted. We struggle with our anger. We struggle with our flesh when it comes to being lazy. I'm going to go to church because I want to be in the presence of God. I want to grow as a Christian. I want to worship God. But then on Sunday mornings, I wake up and I'm so tired that I just can't get out of bed. It's my flesh. There's a pole in this direction. There, there's, there, there's a battle that is raging for all of us. Let me explain our flesh. Let me just put this up. This is by introduction. Number one, our flesh is corrupt. You sit there and say, oh, they're such good people and I try and all this. The Bible is very clear that our flesh and of ourselves, we are corrupt. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul was saying, I know my flesh, and I am constantly, because of my flesh, I, to, to do good is with me. I, I want to read my Bible. I want to pray. I want to seek after God. I, I, I want to live pure. I want to live righteous. It's there. 
But whether I like it or not, like a magnet, I'm constantly pulled over here. I'm constantly pulled to the flesh. I'm constantly battling with my mind for carnal things. It's a natural thing that's there. We lose our temper. We do the things that say, I'm not going to do. Our flesh is corrupt. Our flesh is weak. Jesus was talking to Peter. He's talking about him denying him when they were about to go to the garden. And he said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter stood up and said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I would never do that. Jesus confronted him and said, your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is it's weak. It is not only corrupt, but we have to understand that our flesh is weak. That's why the Bible tells us, put no confidence in the flesh. You sit there and say, I'm going to be pure and I'm going to get along with the opposite sex, but I'm not going to do anything. Your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. You sit there and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to diet, I'm going to be so good, but I'm going to go to that birthday party where there's cake and pizza. But I'm, your spirit indeed is willing, but I promise you, your flesh is weak. Amen. It's weak. I'm not going to miss any more church on Sunday. My spirit indeed is willing, but my flesh is tired. It's weak. Our flesh is at constant war with our spirit. Paul was saying, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The word contrary literally means they're opposites. He says that they lust one towards another. There's a battle raging one toward another. You go to church and say, man, I, wanted, I want to be more disciplined. I, I want more time for God and more time for prayer. Isn't that the whole key to revival? Isn't that the whole key to changing our lives and seeing God work in our kids and seeing life change? You say, oh, yeah, it's the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God and everything we talked about, you can't do it. But then you get home. We're going to read our Bibles, but then we turn on TV and we watch it too late. We're, we're, we're going to fast, but all of a sudden we get that craving. We go to that birthday party. I'll start tomorrow. We're pulled in this direction. It's a constant raging battle between the two of these. Here's the problem with that. Romans 8.8 8 says, So then they that are after the flesh cannot please God. If this is where we're staying and that's what we want, we'll never please God. You cannot have revival. You cannot have the move of God. You just can't. So we can sit there all day long and say, God, bring revival, and we can worship and pray and seek, and in all these things that we know that we want, and all it does is become words, because the Bible said, your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. You can't do that. Paul also said, this I say, then the walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He said, this is, what I, this is where I want you to live. He used the illustration of the word walk. I want you to walk in the spirit. The idea of walk is the idea of, of a discipline. So what he's saying, he said, I want you to walk or I want you to put your life in this manner. That's what I'm asking you to do. Walk in this. So let's get really practical. Matthew 6, 6. This is the Bible. This is Jesus teaching the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching them things that are so important. Inside of this passage, in chapter 5, he said, blessed, blessed. We call them the Beatitudes. And a lot of us grew up learning the Beatitudes. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The word blessed in the Bible talks about being prosperous or being fulfilled or finding satisfaction in those things, being happy. But so when you go after these things, then you flip the chapter and he starts talking about praying. And he says this, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into the closet. When thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And we'll sit there and say, well, I know that. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I... I I, if I was to say, how many of you know that praying is a vital part of the Christian life? No, nobody would be like, oh yeah, of course it is. We've been praying since we've been toddlers at our bedside. We pray before meals. We pray at church. We pray to open up services. We pray to thank God for opening doors for Thrive Church. We pray during the invitation. Praying is part of our life. You say, why is praying such a big part of our lives? Oh, Jesus said it. It's important. It's what we do. It's not a shock. Verse 16, moreover, the word moreover also means this. It means to add to this, or this is also important. Let me tell you this. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they, they have their reward. He says, moreover, when you fast. Now I want, to, I want you guys to see something. When Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, God became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And he comes and he sits down and he teaches them this is what life is all about. And as he's doing that, he sits there and says, it is so vital that you understand the importance of praying. And it's so important that you understand the purpose of fasting. Did Jesus in any way sit there and say, and there's going to be a few radical weirdo Christians that once in a while at random decide to fast. No, he said, when you fast and when you pray. Is it possible that maybe for us as Christians, we've decided only to hold on to one of them or practice one of them? It's like us driving a car with, only, with gasoline in it, but we decide that oil is not important. How far are you going to make it with that philosophy? And say, things are breaking down and things are not working right. And I don't understand all these promises of God, but I'm not experiencing them. Because it could be that maybe we're leaving or taking out something because it goes against our flesh. It's uncomfortable. Amen. It's easier to say, God bless my job and I need, I need a raise. And God, help me to be able to get that new house and, and God be with my kids today than it is to deny my flesh. It's easier to ask and, re- and desire for more. This is a battle. So I think we need to get serious about this. Because it's not something that is a Baptist thing. It's not something that's just something that I I made up in an outline. This is what Jesus said. But it's such a weird thing to understand. It's it's, it's something that we battle with. It's like you're fasting. What do you mean you're fasting? It's like I'm going to give up a donut so that God can answer my prayers. I'm going to give up a meal and... People come up to you and say, hey, let's go out to dinner. And you say, well, I'm not. And then they find out, not that you advertise, but they find out that you're fasting. And they're like, so let me get this straight. You're not eating dinner so that God will hear you more? And they're like, what? It doesn't make sense. So let's back off from what the world thinks or even sometimes what Christian thinks. And let's just look at what is fasting. Fasting, number one, is simply resisting our flesh. We would admit that we all struggle with our flesh. I I don't don't think that's something that you would argue with. You say, I don't battle with my flesh. Let's let's just try it tomorrow, okay? Get up. If you normally have a cup of coffee in the morning, that's how you start the day. Skip it and tell me how you're feeling by noon. You say, "I, I, I have no battle with my flesh. Go ahead and try skipping lunch tomorrow and tell me if you're not cranky by 2 o'clock. We sit there and people get around us and like, what is wrong with you? I didn't get lunch today. Get out of my face. I'm just aggravated. Whatever. Two hours of skipping a meal and we're ready to bite people's heads off. Yeah, we have no problems with our flesh. We're we're, we're cool. We've totally got this. No, we struggle with our flesh. See, fasting is simply confronting our flesh. Just like Jesus was doing with Peter. He went up to him and was like, Hey, Peter, your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. If we don't acknowledge that there is a battle between these two, we're never going to be over here because we're, we never acknowledge the battle. We all, that's what fasting is. Fasting is saying and making a declarative statement to myself. It is a personal thing. You are not my boss. I am not saying yes to you anymore. I am not listening to you. And I tell you, it's an inward battle because I, I, we, we get a craving for something. We're just drawn to that. You, I, it's amazing how we have certain restaurants we like or whatever. We'll get there and wait an hour and a half to two hours to get in that restaurant. We'll drive to the other side of time. Why? I have a craving. I really, really have a craving for it. So you know what happens? We're drawn to whatever it takes to fulfill that craving of our flesh. And God is simply saying, can you imagine if you could divert that craving towards me? If you could train your body and deny your body. But the only way that you're ever going to do that is you have to sit there and say no to this and yes to this. That's the next point. Fasting is telling your flesh no. It is a spiritual discipline. God's given us spiritual disciplines to practice in our life because they make us better. The same way if you're to sit there and say, I want to be healthier as a person, but I, I, I'm lazy and I struggle with this or whatever. So you go to the gym or you go to your basement, you dust off that machine called a treadmill, you plug it back in and you get on it and you begin to do it. And it kind of puts yourself in that mode that I'm going to make myself do what I don't want to do. It is telling my flesh, no, I'm doing this. I'm putting myself into that zone to do what my flesh is opposite of my flesh. It's putting my, that's exactly what fasting is. You're putting yourself in a, in a zone to telling your flesh, no. But I'm going to warn you of this. Your flesh will hate it. Your flesh will fight back. 
Our, 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 our bodies are so wound up on caffeine and sugar and all the stuff, the preservatives and everything, so that as soon as we start detoxing and telling our body no, our bodies begin to scream and say, you are going to die. You are never going to make it. You are miserable. You, you, you're not made to fast. You're not designed to that. But you're, you're, your flesh is a liar. We use the phrase all the time, you know, like, I'm starving to death. We don't, Americans don't know what it means to starve to death. And I'm not saying that there's not times that we aren't hungry, but I'm talking the, the way that we uh, uh, exaggerate it. So this is what we do. We tell, tell ourselves, no, if you're, if you're going to do that, you're, you'll go home to start a diet and you'll take out the trash can because you know if those cookies are in the cabinet, you're eventually going to give in to those cookies and you pull out the Cheez-Its and you pull out all your weaknesses and you take them out of the way. That is what fasting is. You are telling your flesh, no. But it, it's not, it's, there's more to that. It's not just part of this. It's telling your flesh, no. But fasting is how we amplify our prayers. So here it is. We are in this direction. It's like, I'm hungry. I want to eat. I want Starbucks. And I want caffeine. And I, I want this for breakfast. And I'm going to stand in line at McDonald's for 45 minutes because I want that Egg McMuffin. We crave this. But see, it's not just a matter of turning our back. It's a matter of putting our attention here. And I know we struggle with the idea of what is, what, what do you mean it amplifies our prayer life? Let, let me put it like this. Let's say Jenny comes to me and she says, hey, I, I think our relationship would be better if we would talk more. If you would just open up, if you would, if you talk to me and we would communicate more because that's where the strength comes from. That's where the power comes from. So here's what I do. I'm sitting there saying, babe, I know that we need to talk more. Let me finish this. Okay, there's, let, let me get my wordle in for the day. Let, let me get my candy crush and all this other. We, we, we have all this attention. See, the only way things are going to change that I'm going to put my attention on Jenny is I've got to set some things aside. Amen. We're so, oh, I can't, I, I can't fix my relationship. I can't get anything to change because we're not willing to set some things aside. You see, fasting is the idea of setting some things aside for the purpose of wanting something more. It's redirecting our attention. Fasting simply puts our focus on God. That's where the power comes from. It's not just about resisting the flesh. When Jesus was calling the disciples, and we have this verse, but think of it in context of this. Jesus said, if any man's going to come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. But you realize it wasn't just follow me. And Jesus said, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to realize that I'm everything or I'm nothing. It's not just part of your life. It's not just something I want to do with your life. It is saying no to your flesh, denying yourself, and following me. God says in the Bible, he said, have no other gods before me. And you sit there and say, well, my body is not a god. Well, when Philippians, when he's talking, whose god is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who do mine earthly things. Think about what an idol is. An idol is anything that we put up above God. In the Bible, the fasting keeps us in check with that. You know, we sit there and, 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 and talk about how much we want the things of the Spirit of God and how much we're seeking after the things of God. And God says, okay, all right, do, do, would you want that more than, than lunch? And it's amazing. There was, there was one time uh, me and Jenny were watching this show. It was like our night off, and we got excited. We were putting the kids to bed, and Jenny says, you know, we should get ice cream. Man, as soon as she said that, that thought got in my mind, and I was like, I want ice cream. Okay, I mean, it's just a done deal. I want ice cream. Well, I can't remember even what show it was come, coming on, but we had like 20, 25 minutes before our show came out. I said, I'm just Dairy Queen's around the corner. I'm going to run the Dairy Queen. Ran to Dairy Queen, got in line, got up there and said, I'm sorry, we just closed. I was like, oh, I was like, this is crazy. So I thought, I'm going to run to the little grocery store that's down the street. I ran in there. They were closed. I ran into a gas station. I, I'm like this drug addict needing a fix. I'm like, do you have ice cream? And they were like, I'm sorry, we used to have ice cream. It used to be in that cabinet back there, but we, I don't even think they've ever restocked that. I ran back to that cabinet. I get on my knees. I'm digging through this case trying to find this ice cream. I had two ice cream popsicle things that looked like they'd been in there for the last five years and brought them up there. <laughs> Me and Jenny was, it's like, what, what's wrong with it? When something got in my mind, I'm pursuing it. Our flesh is so powerful. 
It will pull you in a direction. It will, it will capture your heart and mind. Man, we look forward to things. We'll get cravings. They, you can watch a TV commercial and they'll, they'll show the hamburger bun coming down on the steaming burger. And you guys know what I'm talking about. And you're sitting there and your mind instantly goes to that. All of a sudden, our flesh takes over. Colossians. Thank you, Mark. Yes, that is like Colossians 3, 2. says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. See, fasting is literally saying, man, I know how much I have a craving for this. But God, there's something that you're convicting me that I want this more. See, the praying part of your prayers intensifying is just the journey to get closer to the Jesus, which means you're cutting off the things that are distracting. That's simply what it is. Fasting is telling your body that you want more of God. That's why when he was preaching and teaching In Matthew 5 says, he said, blessed is those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He put it on our level and he said, I know what you guys know about being hungry and craving. He said, now if you could just hunger and thirst after righteousness. See, the next thing is fasting is coming to God with a heart of surrender. Now I've talked about this because the Bible says about seeking God and we did messages on seeking God. He says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. All of your heart. Now in church, it's so easy to sit there and say, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender. We will sing the songs, wave our hands. We get all emotional, excited about, man, you can have all of me. At the beginning of creation, did you know that these two were actually brought together? Did you guys know that? See, in Genesis, God created man out of the dust of the ground that was his flesh. God formed man out of the dust of the ground and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and then man became a living soul. So from the very beginning, you are more than body. We preach this all the time. You're going to spend forever somewhere. Why? Because you are more than body. You are spirit and you are flesh. You are body and you are soul. There's more to you than that. See, when the Bible's talking about I want all of you, this is worshiping God with all of me. The part that, you know, in Corinthians, he talks about glorifying God in your bodies, which belongs to God, and you are not your own. Paraphrasing that, but the whole emphasis is God wants all of us. So the idea of coming to God with my spirit and not being able to lay down my flesh is not really coming to God with all of me. We're still holding back. God instructs us to fast, but I can't give up a meal. And God's saying, how much surrender is there when you're still holding back? Still holding back. See, fasting is resisting our flesh. Fasting is simply amplifying our prayers or putting our attention on God. But fasting is part of the Christian life. I I said this already, but if I was to tell you that worship is part of the Christian life, nobody would sit there and argue. And you'd sit there and say, well, of course it is, Pastor Tony. It's, It's in the book. If I was to tell you that gathering to pray is part of the Christian life, nobody would debate that because you'd say, Jesus said that. But do we, in a message like this, sit there and say, I don't know why I came today because that's really irrelevant because I'm not doing that? Would we that want the Spirit of God to move so bad because we need a breakthrough with our kids and we need a breakthrough in society, we want to see people say, and we'll sit there and our, we'll sit there and say this a lot. We'll sit there and say, I know that God's coming back soon. We're living in the last days. Do you guys believe that? Yeah. Just turn on the news. Watch what's going on around us. Do you realize that those that when Jesus comes that don't know Jesus Christ, they're lost without Jesus? The only hope that they have is the working of the Spirit of God. Do you know how the Spirit of God, we sit there and say, God, I want you to work. I want you to work in this world today. I want you to show up. Do you know how God shows up? For ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you are not your own. I will dwell in them, and they shall be my people, and I shall be their God. We are the chosen avenue in which God has decided to display the Spirit of God today. And yet we're living over here talking about how corrupt the world is and how much they need that. How serious are we? If we sit there and say, I came here today because I wanted a message about helping me get closer to God and I wanted a message that's going to help me be a better dad and I want a message you realize that everything that I'm talking about is all of the above 
It is how we get victory over sin. It is how we have better days and better parts of our life because of God working through this. Matthew 6, 6, but thou, when thou prayest, enter in the closet. Now shut the door. Pray the Father which is in secret. You know what the idea of that is? When you step away from Netflix, when you step away from your phone, when you step away from the things that please you, and you say, I want something, and you step in there and you shut the door. It's a visual. This is less of me and more of you. I'm shutting things out. Matthew 6, 16, moreover, when ye fast, when you pray. It's been part of the Christian life from the very beginning. They fasted in Judges to seek after God for victory. David fasted when his child was dying and seeking God for healing. They fasted in Ezra for God's help. Jesus fasted to begin and end his public ministry. The early church fasted and prayed when they were looking for a touch of God, when they were looking to uh, pick out new leaders. It was part of the Great Awakening. It was part of the worldwide revivals. It was part of the revivals overseas. It was part of the lives of Jonathan Edwards and George Mueller and George Whitfield. Let's just be honest. We have gone from being people that seek after God through fasting and praying. We are now a nation that is no longer seeking after God, but a nation that will biggie size our combos. And I'm not trying to be funny with that. We will do anything that will intensify the pleasure of ourselves. Let me just be real. Out of things that happen in the church, when we talk about the Spirit of God and we talk about our flesh, we can have a potluck or a cookout of church, and we can have a prayer meeting. Let me ask you, which one will be bigger? How bad do we really want God? How bad are we truly seeking after God? When we can sit there and announce that we're going to have food in the parking lot or food in the fellowship hall, and we have to put out more seating, and yet we can talk about prayer circles or prayer time, and yet it will be vacant. I'm not, I'm not beating anybody up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing the fingers right at me. We're talking about revival. If my people who call my name, my name will humble themselves. You know what humbling is? Humbling is just saying, no, this isn't right. So let me be... Let me just be real with this. I want to see this and as a reality of watching God work and not just something we say. I, I am so serious about this. We wrote a devotional. It's in the lobby. It is free. It starts a week from tomorrow, March 14th. It's an individual study that you will do at home. If anybody's watching online and you want this, we'll help you get this. We want everybody to get this. There's three purpose of this. Seeking after God through his word. Seeking after God through praying and seeking after God through fasting. All the instructions are here. There's 21 days that will start a week from tomorrow that will start with reading the Bible and talking about humbling ourselves, seeking after God, what it means to see revival. All of it's in here. It's broken down. At the beginning of this, it breaks down for you to have a fasting plan. Now, when I say 21 days of us doing this, that doesn't mean that you have to fast for 21 days. If you can do that, praise God for that. that that's not what we're asking. But during that season of time to set aside time to fast. Now, there's different fasts that are mentioned in the Bible, okay? There's the type of fast that is the absolute fast. Well, that's abstaining from everything, okay? There's the absolute. There's divine fast, like Jesus did. 40 days without food and anything that he had during that time. But there's also a partial fast, abstaining from a particular food. Daniel did this in the book of Daniel, where he turned, uh, had a special diet that he was doing. There are partial fasts can we, where we cut out coffee, we cut out sugar, we cut out carbs, or processed food. Then there's a liquid fast, abstaining from all solid foods. foods. And some people are diabetic, and I know that. And I, I would challenge you, consult your doctor, okay? Don't, don't jump into something and just say, well, Pastor Tony told me to do it. No, I, I want you to do this smart and be good uh, and do the right thing as we do this. But there's alternate fasts that you can do in a situation like that, saying, I, I'm giving away, uh, setting aside social media, or I'm, I'm setting aside TV. It's anything of denying the flesh for a pursuit of God. That's what fasting is. Fasting is laying aside something that I crave for something that I want more. 
Fasting is saying no to my flesh because I know this is a weakness because I'm saying yes to what God's doing to pull me closer to him. You sit there and say, I can't do it. I would ask you to do this. Pray about it. Pray about it. Plan on doing it. Just get the book today and start reading through it. Remember, it's, it's about your heart and desire. Because people say, I, I just, I messed up or I'm not good at this. It, it's, if you turn and take one step in this direction and you blow it, that's okay because there's going to be Tuesday after Monday and you can get up and try it again. My challenge to you would be just start. One meal, one day, just start. If this is new to you and you say, I, I have no idea what to do. The first Monday, skip one meal. The second Monday, skip two meals. On the third Monday, skip all the meals. Try going from sun up to sun down. Just start. I say, this is weird. It's not weird. It's Bible. And there's a reason for it. it on April 2nd, we're going to build up in, during this time to have a night of prayer here at the church. It will land in the 21 days. We're going to have a night of prayer praying together and the night of, uh, of us being able to worship God together. You know why I'm doing all this? Because the Bible says to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Why are things not changing? Why, why can we talk about God is great and there's power of God and God can move mountains and God can heal and God can transform lives and God can reach my kids and God, 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 God. And we stay over here. We either need to start doing it or stop complaining about life. We, we, we need to apply what God has said. It's a pursuit that I want more. I've said that in almost all of my message. Every time God talks about pursuing God, seek me and you shall find me. Knock and it shall be open. All of it comes with a promise. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us, that is the Spirit of God. We want Him to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, but it's according to the power that works in us. So yeah, I'm willing to skip cookies and lay aside the drinks and the Starbucks and the Coke and the Pepsi. I want to say no to my flesh because I want to see God bless, thrive in a powerful way. And I want to see God show up in my kid's life in a powerful way. I want to see God work in revival. I want to see lives change. I want to see God work. I, I, I can't describe this all the time. I can't. But I can tell you, when God shows up, you'll know it. When God works, you'll know it. There's a story in the Bible that I preached on before. The disciples were trying to cast out the demon. It was something bigger and greater than themselves. They did everything that they knew to do. And then they went to him and said, You're, we went to your disciples and they were not able to cast them out. And Jesus said this, Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you should be able to move mountains. You know what that is? That is faith in the spirit of God, faith in the power of God. If you just have faith, if you pursue the spiritual things, how be it? This kind goeth not out by, by prayer, and fasting. Less of you, more of him. Less of him, me, Tony, and more of God, the Spirit of God and the power of God.